the 48 laws of power by Robert Greene. Law 1. Never outshine the master. Judgment. Always make those above you feel completely superior. In your desire to please and impress them, do not go too far in displaying your talents or you may accomplish the opposite. Inspire fear and insecurity. Make your masters appear more brilliant than they are and you will attain the heights of power. Transgression of the Law Nicholas Fogart, Louis XIV's finance minister in the first year of his reign, was a generous man who loved lavish parties, pretty women and poetry. He also loved money, for he led an extravagant life. Fogart was clever and very much indispensable to the king. So, when the Prime Minister Julius Mezarin died in 1661, the finance minister expected to be named the successor. Instead, the king decided to abolish the position. This and other signs made Fagat suspect that he was falling out of favor, and so he decided to ingratiate himself with the king by stagging the most spectacular party the world had ever seen. The party's ostensible purpose would be to commemorate the competition of Fogart's schedule. Vuxli Vicomet, but its real function was to pay tribute to the king, the guest of honor. The most brilliant novelty of Europe and some of the greatest minds of the time, La Fontaine, La Roche, Foucault, Madame de Sévigny, attended the party. Molière wrote a play for the occasion in which he himself was to perform at the evening's conclusion. The party began with a lavish seven course dinner featuring foods from the Orient never before set tasted in France, as well as new dishes created specially for the night. The meal was so accompanied with music commissioned by Foucault to honor the king. After dinner, there was a promenade through the Chattis Gardens. The grounds and fountains of works Le Vicomet were to be the inspiration for Versailles. Foucault personally accomplished by young king through the geometrically aligned arrangement of shubere and flower beds. Arriving at Gardens Kennel, they witnessed a fireworks display which was followed by the performance of Molière play. The party ran well into the night and everyone agreed it was the most amazing affair they had ever seen. The next day, Fakad was arrested by the king's head mistaker, the Artegnan. Three months later, he went on trial for stealing from the country's treasury. Fagat was found guilty and sent to the most isolated prison in France, high in Perrin's mountains, where he spent the last 20 years of his life in solitary confinement. Interpretation Louis XVI, the Sun King, was a proud and arrogant man who wanted to be the center of attention at all the times. He could not countenance being outdone in lavishness by anyone, and certainly not his finance minister. To succeed Fogart, Louis chose Jean-Baptiste Colbert, a man famous for his parsimony and for giving the dullest parties in Paris. Colbert made sure that any money liberated from the treasury went straight into Louis' hands. With the money, Louis built a palace even more magnificent than Fogart's, the glorious palace of Versailles. He used the same architect, decoration, and garden designer. And at Versailles, Louis hosted parties even more extravagant than the one that caused Foucault his freedom. Let us examine the situation. The evening of the party, as Foucault presented spectacle on spectacle to Louis, each more magnificent than the one before, he imagined the affair as demonstrating his loyalty and devotion to the king. Not only did he think the party would put him back in the king's favor, he thought it would show his good taste, his connection and his popularity, making him indispensable to the king and demonstrating that he would make an excellent prime minister. Instead, however, each new spectacle, each appreciative smile bestowed by the guest on Foucault made it seem to Louis that his own friends and subjects were more charmed by the finance minister than by the king himself, and that Foucault was actually flaunting his wealth and power. Rather than flattering Louis XIV, Fogart elaborate party offended the king's vanity. Louis would not admit this to anyone. Of course, instead he found a convenient excuse to admit this to everyone. 
he found a convenient excuse to write himself off a man who had inadvertently made him feel insecure. Such is the faith in some form or other of all those who unbalance the master's sense of self, poke holes in his vanity, or make him doubt his preeminence. When the evening began, Fugat was at the top of the world. By the time it had ended, he was at the bottom. Observance of the Law In the early 1600s, the Italian astronomer and mathematician Galileo found himself in a precarious position. He depended on the generosity of great rulers to support his research and so, like all Renaissance scientists, he would sometimes make gifts of his invention and discoveries to the leading patrons of the time. Once, for instance, he presented a military compass he had invented to Duke of Gonzaga. Then he dedicated a book explaining the use of compass to the Medicis. Both rulers were grateful and through them Galileo was able to find more students to teach. No matter how great the discovery, however, his patrons usually paid him with gifts, not cash. This made for a lifetime of constant insecurity and dependence. There must be an easier way, he thought. Galileo hit on a new strategy in 1610, when he discovered the moons of Jupiter. Instead of dividing the discovery among his patrons, giving one the telescope he had used, dedicating a book to another, and so on, as he had done in the past, he decided to focus exclusively on the Medicis. He chose the Medicis for one reason. Shortly after Cosimo, I had established the Medici dynasty. In 1814, he had made Jupiter the mightest of gods and the Medici symbol, a symbol of a power that went beyond politics and banking, one linked to ancient Rome and its divinities. Galileo turned his discovery of Jupiter's moon into a cosmic event, honoring the Medici's greatness. Shortly after the discovery, he announced that the bright stars, the moon of Jupiter, offered themselves in the heavens to his telescope at the same time as Cosimo Aitis enthronement. He said that the number of moons four harmonized with the number of the Medicis and that the moons orbited Jupiter as these four suns revolved around Cosimo I, the dynasty's founder. More than coincidence, this shows that the heavens themselves reflected the eschanticity of the Medici family. After he dedicated the discovery to the Medicis, Galileo commissioned an emblem representing Jupiter sitting on a cloud with the four stars circling around him and presented this to Cosimo II as a symbol of his link to stars. In 1610, Cosimo II made Galileo his official court philosopher and mathematician with a full salary. For a scientist, this was the cup of a lifetime. The days of beginning for patronage were over. Interpretation In one stroke, Galileo gained more with his new strategy than he had in the years of packing. The reason is simple. All masters want to appear more brilliant than other people. They do not care about science or empirical truth or the latest invention. They care about their name and their glory. Galileo gave the Medicis infinitely more glory by linking their name with cosmic forces than he had by making them the patrons of some new scientific gadget or discovery. Scientists are not spared the vagaries of court life and patronage. They too must serve masters who hold the poor strings, and the great intellectual powers can make the master feel insecure, as if he were only there to supply the funds, an ugly, ignorable job. The producer of a great work wants to feel he is more than just the provider of the financing. He wants to appear creative and powerful and also more important than the work produced in his name. Instead of insecurity, you must give him glory. Galileo did not change the intellectual authority of the Medicis with his discovery or make them feel inferior in any way. By literally aligning them with the stars, he made them shine brilliantly among the courts of Italy. He did not outshine the master, he made the master outshine all others. Keys to Power Everyone has insecurities. When you show yourself in the world and display your talents, you naturally stir up all kinds of resentment, envy and other manifestation of security. This is to be expected. You cannot spend all your life worrying about the pity feelings of others. With those above you, however, you must take a different approach. 
when it comes to power out training the master is perhaps the worst mistake of all do not fool yourself into thinking that life has changed much since the days of louis fourteen and the medicis those who attain high standing in life are like kings and queens they want to feel secure in their position and superior to those around them in intelligence wit and charm it is a deadly but common misperception to believe that by displaying wanting your gifts and talents you are winning the master's affection he may find appreciation but at his first opportunity he will replace you with someone less intelligent less attractive less threatening just as louis fourteen he replaced the sparking forgot with the plain cold word and as with louis he will not admit the truth but will find an excuse to rid himself of your presence this law involves two rules that you must realize first you can inadvertently outshine a master simply by being yourself there are masters who are more insecure than others monstrously insecure you may naturally outshine them by your charm and grace no one had more natural talents than eston malfredi prince of venza the most handsome of all the young princes of italy he captivated his subject with his generosity and open spirit in the year 1500 caesar borgia laid siege to venza when the city surrendered the citizen expected the worst from cruel borgia who however decided to spare the town he simply occupied two fortresses executed none of its citizens and allowed prince manfredi 18 at the time to remain with his court in complete freedom a few weeks later though soldiers hauled estore manfredi away to a roman prison a year after that his body divert fished out of the river tiber a stone tied round his neck borgia justified the horrible death with some sort of trumped up charge of treason and conspiracy but the real problem was that he was notoriously vain and insecure the young man was outshining him without even trying given manfredi the natural talents the prince mere presence made boltria seem less attractive and charismatic the lesson is simple if you cannot help being charming and superior you must learn to avoid such monsters of vanity either that or find a way to mute your good qualities when in the company of a caesar borgia second never imagine that because of the master loves you you can do anything you want entire books could be written about favorites who fell out of favor by taking their status for granted for daring to outshine in late 16th century japan the favorite of emperor hideyoshi was a man called shen no rikyu the premier artist of the tea ceremony which had become an obsession for the nobility he was one of hideyoshi's most trusted advisers had his own apartment in palace and was honored throughout japan yet in 1591 hideyoshi had him arrested and sentenced to death rikyu took his own life instead the cause of his sudden change of fortune was discovered later it seems that rikyu former peasant and later court favorite had had a wooden statue made of himself wearing sandals and posing loftily he had had the statue placed in most important temple inside the palace gate in clear sight of royalty who often would pass by to hideyoshi this signified that rikyu had no sense of limits presuming that he had the same rights as those of the highest nobility he had forgotten that his position depended on the emperor and had come to believe that he had earned it on his own this was an unforgivable miscalculation of his own importance and he paid for it with his life remember the following never take your position for granted and never let any favors you receive to go your head knowing the dangers of outshining your masters you can turn this law to your advantage first you must flatter and puff up your master overt flattery can be effective but has its limits it is too direct and obvious and looks bait to other courtiers discreet flattery is much more powerful if you are more intelligent than your master for example seem the opposite make him appear more intelligent than you act naive make it seem that you need his expertise comment harmless mistake that will not hurt you in 
the long run but will give you the chance to ask for his help master adore such requests a master who cannot bestow on you the gifts of his expertise mid rack to ring core and will at your instant if your ideas are more creative than your master ascribe them to him in as public a manner as possible make it clear that your advice is merely an echo of his advice if you surpass your master in wit it is okay to play the role of the cold jester but do not make him appear cold and surely by comparison tone down your humor if necessary and find ways to make him seem to dispenser of amusement and good cheer if you are naturally more sociable and generous than your master be careful not to be the cloud that blocks his radiance from others he must appear as the sun around which everyone revolves radiating power and brilliance the center of attention if you are thrust into the position of entertaining him a display of your limited means may win you his sympathy an attempt to impress him with your grace and generosity can prove fatal learn from fukat or pay the price if all of these cases it is not a weakness to discuss your strengths if in the end the lead to power by letting others outshine you you remain in control instead of being a victim of their insecurity this will all come in handy the day you decide to rise above your inferior status if like galileo you can make your master shine even more in the eyes of others then you are a god sent and you will be instantly promoted authority avoid outshining the master all superiority is odious but the superiority of a subject over his prince is not only stupid it is fatal this is a lesson that the stars in the sky teach us they may be related to the sun and just as brilliant but they never appear in his company reversal you cannot worry about upsetting every person you come across but you must be selectively cruel if your superior is a falling star there is nothing to fear for from outshining him do not be merciful your masters had no such scruples in his own cold blooded climb to the top goes his strength if he is weak discreet hasten his downfall outdo out charm outmart him at key moments if he is very weak and ready to fall let nature take its course do not risk outshining a feeble superior it might appear cruel or spiteful but if your master is firm in his position yet you know yourself to be the more capable bide your time and be patient it is the nature course of things that power eventually fades and weakens your master will fall some day and if you play it right you will outlive and some day outshine him